All right, hello everybody and good morning. Welcome to Heifer USA's Great American Farm Tour. Today we are coming to you from Roanoke, Indiana at Seven Sons Farm. I'm so excited to be here. I hope you are too. Uh, joined by my tour guide, Blake Hitsfield today. Welcome to the farm. Awesome. We're so glad that you're here. There's gonna be so much to see in this video. You're not gonna to wanna to miss a single minute of it and stay tuned until the end because we have literally uh, just some amazing enterprises, amazing scales of production that are going on here. Really, really excited to be here with you all today. So if you've got any questions, type them in the live chat. If you're watching the recorded version of this video, just type them down in the comments below and we'll answer as many of those as we can along the way. But we're gonna jump right into it and get started with the tour today because there's just so much to see. I mean, they're doing massive enterprises at scale here, awesome production facilities, raising pastured poultry, grass-fed finished sheep, cattle, uh, layer hens, pastured pork. They're doing it through the winter even. Just some really amazing stuff that you're not gonna wanna miss. So. Stick around with us, ask your questions, and I hope you enjoy the tour today. Blake, how you doing, man? Doing good, doing good. Awesome, well thank you again so much for taking us along. Absolutely. On glad, the journey today. Glad you're here, and I wanna thank everybody for tuning in, and whether you're watching live or later, uh, we just uh, love to share what's going on in our farm. We're very passionate about what we do. Uh, when it comes to raising healthy food and taking care of our land and uh, taking care of the people that make up the team here at Seven Sons. So. That's awesome. Yeah, you guys have a big team here, don't you? Yeah, it's grown over the years and uh, that's what makes it uh, even uh, more exciting to come to work is you can, uh, you know, it's, it's fun to be passionate about something, but when you can share that passion with, with other people, mm -hmm. um, it's just that compounding effect happens. So uh, we've got a great team here and you're gonna see some of them today as we uh, drive around and see things and, and tour the farm. And uh, yeah, cool. So well, I can't answer any questions. I can't wait to get started. Well, let me ask you just at the top here real quick, tell me just a little bit about the history of Seven Sons Farm. Yeah, so the history of Seven Sons Farm, we started the brand in 2000. Uh, prior to that, this was a conventional uh, farm. We raised uh, 1,500 acres of row crops. We had farrow to finish confinement. We sold the IBP that uh, got bought out by Tyson later. And um, uh, we got to the point where, uh, one, the farm, uh, we started losing acreage to just commercial development, residential development. So the farm was uh, not becoming profitable because you know you need about 1,500 acres in conventional to just get enough off the farm for one income. Mm -hmm. um, so we we're losing acreage there. And at the same time, we had a, a health crisis in the family. And uh, when you combine those two things together, it got us thinking outside the box. Um, what can we do unconventionally medicine wise to help um, mm -hmm. our family members? It'd be my mom. And then also when your back's up against the wall and you're not profitable, uh, you either get out or you figure out something different to do mm -hmm. um, to try to make a change to be profitable on your farm. And uh, so that kind of started the journey in the 90s. And um, like I say, in 2000, we formed the Seven Sons brand. Um, and that was at the point where uh, we thought it was hard farming conventionally making a profit. And when you start a new, uh, a new business, you think, well, you start in at uh, ground zero and then you learn and, and grow. And actually you start here and then you go down because you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the next 10 years were really hard uh, for us. Uh, but uh, thanks to my parents and just the great team and family we have here, we were able to uh, work through those challenges. We learned a lot of things wrong. I feel like we're still learning them, but that learning pace has slowed a little bit to where we can actually be profitable and make uh, make a business out of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so our farm went from 1500 acres down to about 500 acres mm -hmm. and the neat thing is is we went from 1500 acres that was barely enough to be profitable for one family and now we have a team of about 20 full-time people the team's up to about 40 all together with from part-time so we're providing income for and, and and careers for all those people as well off of the 550 acres then we have That's partnering so cool. farms that are helping out as well on the uh, production side for the uh, for the cattle and for the hogs. Um, so it's really, that's like a ecosystem here that uh, we've been able to partner with just local farms and just uh, the community around us and the people that work here. So. Hey, that's super cool. Well, I can't wait to go check it out um, and see all of the progress yeah. that you guys have made. So yeah. where do you want to go to first? Uh, we will start with uh, where we're washing eggs because we're washing eggs right now and they're only going to be washed for a little while. So let's go in here and we'll take a look at them. 
We are very specific um, when we look at our production enterprises. We'll talk a little bit later about that, but um, hopefully you can see the line. Let's step over here. Yeah. So this is an automatic egg washer and grater. Um, we've got the, uh, the conveyor on this side where we're uh, loading the eggs. We're washing eggs about three times a week, three to four times a week, depends on uh, the schedule and what's going out. So we have got an automatic uh, loader, the vacuum system. Pulls, so, them, pulls them off the, car, the trays yeah, over there. We'll pull them off the trays, load them onto here, and then they go through uh, the candler right here. And mm -hmm. we've got this tarp around here that kind of just darkens the uh, darkens the light so that you can actually see a little better in there. Oh, I see. Yeah. So you can see the eggs, they kind of they kind of um, illuminate a little bit. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And uh, Rebecca, what, what are you looking for? Caroline fractures. Air bubbles, anything that's kind of abnormal, uh, maybe a blood spot, anything like that, that you can pick out. When dark eggs, uh, brown eggs, it's harder to see some of those but we still can uh, do a, a pretty good job at uh, getting sure every egg gets graded and making sure that we can pull out any of the uh, abnormalities. That's awesome. Yeah. And then they're going they through great here. Job. Yeah, so then we've got a, uh, a washing. So there's a tube in here that, uh, well, you can see it here. So this tube here has just warm water going through it. And you can see it, it falling out here and just dribbles on the eggs as they go through. There's no other solution, it's just, it's just water. Yeah. And uh, the brushes run, and the eggs kind of rotate as they're on that conveyor. So the first chamber is just wash, and the next three chambers here are all the dry. So there's no more water hitting the eggs, it's just the brushes and the, and the fans to try to get a lot of that moisture off them awesome. before they go to the, the, uh, the grading station. Right. So then the uh, the eggs come through here. We've got uh, an eye here that is weighing the egg and sizing it. So then these kickers here will kick them off according to however we're sorting the eggs. So and then they come down, and then we're able to uh, use the vacuum system as well to be able to pack the eggs. So these things here kind of vibrate. You can see them moving back and forth, and. It gets them down in place and make sure they're facing the right direction already. You don't have to do that. So this is kind of a new addition uh, that we've added in the last year. We used to just do this all by uh, by hand, and that was a lot of work. So yeah. we are uh, that gathering. That makes it a lot easier. Wow, a look lot at that. Easier. That's incredible. Do you like the system better? <laughs> yes, I bet you do. That's super cool. Yeah. Got your labels, got your boxes. And uh, are you guys shipping this stuff all over the country? So yeah, we're, we're shipping as well as, uh, we're in, um, I think, uh, multiple Whole Foods stores. I'm not quite sure how many, 70 yeah. Whole Foods stores cool. across the country. So um, yeah, so they either go out there or they go through our farm store. Um, and we're gonna see where these are being laid out on pasture later, right? We are, we are. We're gonna get out there, we're gonna see, and actually be able to probably, depending on uh, the time of day, might be able to see how we're gathering them as well, so. Cool, I, I, but, see, a, I see a familiar looking logo over here. <laughs> um, so you got boxes for Joe's Farm. Yeah, I think, believe you guys are just there visiting, we, right? We were, Great American Farm Tour uh, number one was at yeah. Joe Coopson's farm, Joe so Coopson, if you so. saw that video, guys, this is where the eggs came from for his farm. Yeah, so we work with Joe, we're excited to do that. We're a USDA grading station so that allows us to be able to uh, custom grade or wash other people's eggs so well that's super cool well let's head, head back out I think the signal is getting a little weak so we'll head back out over here absolutely So we'll gather anywhere from 10 to 12,000 eggs a day. Wow. That's all done by hand. And, and, and I just want to show folks all these eggs. This is like one day's worth, yeah? Um, probably not even? No, not quite even. Yeah. That's, yeah, probably about three pallets, two and a half pallets a day. So. Wow, man, that, that is an incredible operation. People are uh, flipping out online uh, all over the world. Slovakia, Australia, I want to say hey to Rick, uh, Merrick. Um, Leo and Asperis from the Philippines, Organic Gal in Maryland, 
Thank you guys so much. I hope you guys are enjoying this tour. If you thought the eggs were cool, stick around. We got a lot more to show you. Uh, really great content just like that. That's amazing. That's yeah, super cool. and you don't have to start there. We, mm -hmm. we were able to, you know, we, we went from washing eggs and putting them in cartons, you know, just in the kitchen sink mm -hmm. to as it grows, it makes sense to um, make those investments. This unit here is anywhere from 50 to 70,000 um, with the the uh, loading system, the unloading system, the washing, the grading. Um, so it can take time to get to enough scale to make it work, but uh, we're not even running it at half capacity. So we're only washing eggs, you know, gotcha. three times a week. The total cost for the infrastructure there, you said is about- I think about 70,000 if you bought it all new. Gotcha. Uh, I could be wrong a little bit. Uh, yeah, no, that's good information though yeah. for, for our viewers. Thank I think we got it from that. Natural Poultry. So it's a Model 20 uh -huh. uh, washer. From and Natural Poultry is the company that made some of that poultry. stuff? Oh, National, National gotcha. Yep, cool. I believe. So. And uh, we, we were, we're not able to show you guys inside here, um, but this is where they're doing all of your distribution, or, yeah, order fulfillment. Order, order fulfillment. So this, uh, this building here would be our basically our distribution center. Mm -hmm. So uh, all the product that, uh, that we raise and get processed goes uh, up to Michigan, gets processed, and it comes back down frozen from our processor. And then we utilize, we've got on-site uh, cold storage here, as well as uh, we're just Ten miles from Fort Wayne as well, and they've got a uh, nice cold storage facility there, oh, so nice. we can utilize both. So it makes it really, uh, really nice. It's kind of an unfair advantage to be that close to um, cold storage. So yeah, the, yeah. So product comes back here, and then we ship. Um, we ship out via UPS, um, and uh, we also utilize some other local carriers, mm -hmm. which uh, which is really neat because as logistics continue to. Um, grow in the United States, um, there's there's more opportunities for other companies to get in the logistics business. So meaning mm -hmm. there's more options than just FedEx, UPS, DHL, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so if you can find, um, which we've been able to do, is find local couriers that either service the, a big city or um, you know a certain amount of zip codes mm -hmm. um, or the whole state, they usually uh, can get you uh, a little better service, a little mm -hmm. better deliverability and uh, hopefully some cost savings. Um, so we utilize that as well. There's two other companies that we use outside of UPS. So. Cool, yeah. awesome. Well, if you guys uh, have any questions, let us know, guys. Uh, we're gonna hop in the side-by-side -side and take a little drive, right? We are. We All right. Are. We're gonna jump in and get you open here. Thank you, sir. Got beautiful weather here. Yeah, it's gorgeous out here. You got some nice fall foliage. Um, beautiful weather. I mean, it's going to be like 60s and 70s today. Um, let's see, we got a question coming in from Organic Gal. She says, do you wash the eggs because you're required to do that or why do you wash them? Um, so we're not required to wash the eggs, uh, but we are required um, to grade them. They have to be graded. They have to go through some form of grading. So uh, we are, uh, so we're just, yeah, we're just, Adding the water to it. Um, Customers just, probably like a cleaner product. Yeah, it depends on who you're who you're selling to. Some you know, some people like a pasture packed egg. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's some things you got to work through legality wise for that. But uh, you can still run them through your grader without washing them, so they still have the, the bloom on them, which is a lot. A lot of customers want that, where they have that fresh egg with the bloom on it. They don't have to. Uh, don't have to be refrigerated. Um, gotcha. Only in the United States do we refrigerate eggs. Yeah, I know, I know. It's crazy. Yeah, that was probably, I think Organic Gal said she was from Maryland, but I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of our international viewers are like, why are they washing their why eggs? Why do they wash eggs? <laughs> I don't know. If you can convince me a great reason why we have to wash the eggs um, and, and refrigerate them. Because so. gotcha. once, you, once you grade or wash an egg, it has to be refrigerated. Yeah. Man, it is just beautiful out here. I'm just gonna show, pan the camera around just to show you guys a little bit so you can see just how gorgeous this place is and um, get to some more of your questions while we're driving over to check out uh, the pastured hogs where we're going first, yeah, right? Yeah, we're gonna get to see one of the groups of the pigs that we have out on pasture here. So it's the closest one, so we'll take a, we'll take a peek at those. We're very, uh, we're very specific with our, with our production models. Um, in, in our industry, it's very easy to um, overcomplicate and get a lot of things going on, and it's it's hard to uh, it's hard to have the bandwidth to keep them uh, keep them keep them focused and, and profitable at the same time. So, um, 
we did something years ago where we just really tried to simplify them yeah. um, and then scale them. And then where we need to fill in the gaps, we have partners for that. So, um, for instance, we don't do any farrowing on our farm. Right. We just focus on the finishing side of it. Yeah, that's what we do too. Yeah, it's, uh, it really streamlines it. So then we're able to, to scale that at the same time mm -hmm. uh, because we're not uh, spread so thin trying to do every... Now, it's, it's easy to look at, at hogs as one enterprise, but really it's multiple enterprises going on at the same time between the farrowing, the gestation, and then, you know, uh, the, the finishing. So this here, what we just passed is our, our, our portable feed wagon. Okay. So we're able to uh, we're able to mix our own feed here on the farm. Yep. We've got a mill, and then we can grind into it. So whether we're taking um, our non-GMO feed out to the hogs, to the chickens, uh, this can, because it's all set up on a tractor, uh -huh. you can get out to the where the feeders are, where the animals are, maybe when the weather's not as great as you would like it to be anyways. Yeah, no, that's the game changer right there. It is, it is. That's and it helps so much. I mean, uh, we're, we do something similar, but not quite to that scale. I mean, to have your own, you know, looks like you got your own um, hopper on there. And yeah, it's, it's a nine ton, um, nine ton hopper, and that auger will swing out, and we're able to hit. Um, the feeders, like I think Joseph just fed the, the hogs this morning. Oh, good, perfect filled, timing. Filled the feeder there. So, <laughs> good to see him in action. Hey, Zara, if you there leave that is. down for us. All right, Thank thanks. You, sir. No, I'll quit. close it. Hey, here they are. I told him I'd close the gate, but I gotta remember to do that, though. That's... <laughs> yeah. I'll help, I'll help remind you. There we go. There or we go. somebody in the audience, you guys, if we don't close that gate on our way out. Yeah, we're going to be have to quit. And get, well, let, let us know in the comments. <laughs> you'll be watching us chase pigs, maybe. No. Uh, swing over there and get that gate for or the door for you. I think I got it. Got it? Thank you. All right. Awesome. So this would be a group of, of hogs we've had out on pasture uh, for the past, um, I think they came in, in May. But uh, so we, like I mentioned, we don't do any of our own farrowing. We have uh, two, three other farms that meet our production standards mm -hmm. and they do the farrowing and they just focus on that part of it and they do a fantastic job. They don't have to worry about uh, once the pigs are weaned, they just get them to that 60 to 80 pound range and then we take them from there. Um, so they come already trained to hot wire. Oh, that's so, good. Yes. Yep. So uh, we, we, we t that's what the first thing that we do is train them. Train them. Yep. Yeah. And uh, you do want to make sure they are trained before you just stick them into two wire, uh, poly wire like mm -hmm. this. Um, and really the two wires are, are more for when they're younger and for me, <laughs> the security for me knowing that they're not going to get out. But as long as you have really one good hot wire that they can visually see mm -hmm. and they've respected at a young age, um, we found that one wire can work just as well with uh, hogs this size right here. Awesome. And then how many are y'all finishing in a year roughly? Uh, so we'll finish about 600 a mm -hmm. year on our farm. and. Uh, There'll be uh, a couple other farms we'll finish another 600, so we'll sell um, a little over a thousand hogs a year. That's amazing. That's yep. that's really incredible. I mean, I think we're doing about four or five hundred, and I know how much effort goes into just doing that. So that, yeah, that's and, pretty and, awesome. And hogs are destructive by nature. Mm -hmm. They're so destructive, mm -hmm. and that's and it's it's. I keep telling our team, it's like it's our job. That's okay. It's our job now to just utilize that and uh, manage for what we want. Get a little so. closer and show folks your hogs. They're yeah. looking good. Yeah, and, and how do you manage that? Tell me a little bit about how pastured uh, pork works in your guys' regenerative ag systems. So, hogs need shade. So we always try to build their, their pens so that they have access to shade. But we're going to use them in areas where we feel like we need a little more disturbance. Mm -hmm. So this field that we're in here is uh, pretty high in fescue, not a lot of diversity. So we find where we can take the hogs in and create a little bit of an element of disturbance in the soil, um, that latent seed bank will come back uh, very strong. The seeds are there, it's just a matter of giving the opportunity for them to express themselves. And uh, so that's how we're gonna use the hogs in more of our um, pasture, open pasture area. Mm -hmm. When we get more into the woods, um, you know, we're looking just to open up a little bit, let more sunlight down through. And when we drive through, we had the hogs over there earlier in the part of the year, and you can kind of see how it's opened up in the woods. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll show when we drive by, but 
Um, we really don't want uh, any more than than 50% disturbance. Like that's our goal. If we get over that, then um, you know it's, it, we've not done our job properly, gotcha. in my opinion, uh, here for our land and what we're trying to achieve here. And how how often are you kind of moving them from paddock to paddock? Yeah. So that's where the the whole adaptive yeah, management comes just in. Whatever your eyeball says. And whatever the eyeball <laughs> says, based upon the density, how big of an area they had, and then a lot depends on the weather. Mm -hmm. um, when they're when it's nice and dry, you can get by with leaving them in one spot for maybe a week or ten days because they're not as aggressive. And and when they're this age right here, they're not nearly as uh, aggressive as when they are eighty to one hundred twenty pounds. Yeah. At that age, they are so aggressive and they're always. Um, out trying to root something up, but at this at this size, they're more interested in eating, sleeping, and and repeat. Yep, yep. That they, they've they've uh, gotten all that out of out of their system. That rambunctious stage. Yeah. And then I see you got your big uh, grain, your big feeder yep. over here. Big and feeder hopper there. So we just moved that uh, when we moved the pig. So when we set up a new wire, all we are going to do is just so they're moving to uh, to this side over here. We'll set up a pen and we will just uh, move the feeder across. We'll lift the wire up and the hogs are trained, they'll just go right underneath the wire. Gotcha. So there's no gate or anything in here. It's oh. just lift the wire. So if we lifted the wire here, they think that there would be a new pen over here and they would just go right under it. So when you move them, I'm sorry, you said you just lift the wire up? Yeah, so we'll have another wire on this side, which will represent the new pen. Uh -huh. And then we just lift four wires up basically, put a post in the middle of it. And nice. In 20 minutes at this, stage they're trained really well they'll come running right through when we first get them uh we'll just have to throw uh, a bucket of feed kind of in a teeth across form so run right over the wire and then this way and then they learn to come right up to it and they trust going under the wire when they see that post up like that and then just they pigs are smart they catch on very they quickly. are they are really they actually know when the fence is off too yeah yeah no that's <laughs> super cool uh, just real quick, want to say hey to some of our audience. Thanks to Sham in Texas for watching. Uh, Matt Acre Farms, appreciate you guys. Karen Gallegos. Um, Sham says Seven Sons is one of the best farms in the Midwest. Organic Gal says this is a, this live is so interesting. So everybody's enjoying the content. Thank you guys so much again. This is this is super cool. Yeah. Yep. And and it doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, it only takes us about 20 minutes to set up a new pen every mm -hmm. time we come out here and do it. Mm -hmm. um, if you have the right tools and equipment and the skill set, it just doesn't take long. It doesn't yep. have to be this, you know, drawn out deal. Now, when you're working through the woods, you may be, you know, working through some, yep. some briars and some, some, some and shrubs. I, so I don't, I don't see your solar charger. How are you guys uh, making this fence hot? Yeah, so um, we are running it off of our main charger. Uh -huh. um, so we have um, a 100 joule charger mm -hmm. is our main charger, and it runs basically a mile and a half. Down, so the, down this whole down road? Down this whole lane here. We'll go through that whole lane yeah. on the tour, and it just feeds off of that. So all of our packs will feed off of it, and so this will get heated from that. So if we're running a netting, um, then we will run a solar charger okay. because yeah. they just draw so much yeah. uh, so much uh, current from awesome. your, your main your main charger. So, but yeah, this is running about eight thousand. So yeah, hot. yeah, it's good. It's, it's good, good and plenty. They look, they look like they know. They know. <laughs> One thing uh, that can be challenging is watering hogs. Yeah, yeah. So um, we've tried a lot of different scenarios mm -hmm. with with an outside water. This has been the most effective. So mm -hmm. you can have the, the bigger tubs where they're like a 75 gallon, um, mm -hmm. but they're harder to move. Yeah. And um, and then they when they get mud in, they're harder to clean because mm -hmm. pigs will always come to a water with something in its mouth and then drop it in the water. So this here is just a uh, 10 gallon, actually I think it's seven gallon, mm -hmm. little trough here. Mm -hmm. And what we do is just run a hot wire, a steel hot wire around the front of it I onto this pole. Right okay. And loops it around and that keeps the pigs from then Getting inside of it. Getting inside of it and flopping it because they would just take it and dip, tip it over so they create a mud hole. Yeah. Pigs like mud. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, they can make, it seems like they can make mud out of a heavy dew. <laughs> but, uh, and you kind of got it like halfway under the hot wire here too. Is that intentional? Hot, yeah, halfway under the hot wire. That way we can reach it from this side. They don't get into the float in the hose right here. So then they just reach over and they drink out of it, but they don't disturb it. So if we need to, um, you know, if we need to dump it out, you just like this. Clean it. Shove it back under. Nice. Just like that. That's pretty simple. Yeah. So, or if it rains uh, 
two inches overnight and this area right here where they're standing to drink is just really muddy and you don't want that much disturbance mm -hmm. you just take this slide it on down so it only takes a couple minutes doesn't take a lot of work uh, to move it nice nice and then what kind of uh, valve is this right here uh, it's just a regular float i don't know okay cheap you yeah no, that makes sense in it, your uh, tractor supply stores or something like that awesome so, thank you for that demonstration that, yeah. that's awesome I've tried a lot of different water scenarios. So, so, so have we. we. I think we're using we're using something really similar to this. Yep. Um, our tote's a little bit bigger, maybe double the size of yours right here. Mm -hmm. um, we, we got a video on our channel for anybody that wants to watch it about how we make ours, but we do basically the same thing. Yeah. You know, using a small tote like this, um, easily cleanable, can dump it out. Running a hot, you know, either running a hot wire around it or halfway underneath your yeah. your actual poly wire to keep them from getting in there and. That's just, you know, running a hose out to it, and that's just what works best for us, too. Yep, and keeping it simple is sometimes the, sometimes the hardest thing to do. Yeah. It's easy to complicate something. <laughs> cool. Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much for showing us this. This is really amazing. If you guys have any questions about their pastured pork operation, get them in the chat uh, while we're heading over to the next place. Um, here in just a second, we'll answer some more of your questions. Take a quick close-up uh, look at your grain feeder over here, and I'm curious about uh, the the grain you guys use. Yeah, what, so what it's, all, tell me? it's all it's uh, all pretty much raised locally here. So it's non-GMO corn, uh, soybeans. We're not soy-free, um, so it's non-GMO corn, soybeans, oats, and then just a, a mineral mix that you would put in. Gotcha. So Kennedy Reynolds asked, um, "Do you set up wallows for your pigs? Um, if I feel like they need them, yeah. then I will. Yeah. Yep." So I'll just let the hose run where I want it to run and let them, let them have at it. And is that going to be like just weather dependent? Kind weather of? dependent. Gotcha. Yeah. And I mean, that's how pigs stay clean mm -hmm. is uh, they need that. They, they need that, uh, that mud on their skin and it dries up. Is this the off. typical size feeder you guys use or? It is. Yep. yep. A one ton or ton and a half size feeder is what we'll end up using. Nice. And uh, is it mounted to that pallet or it is, is it? I don't think this one's mounted. So, so usually do you usually or no? Um, just if to we move have them time, we'll, yeah. we'll mount them. But if not, then we'll just let them sit on them and then we'll just use a, a skid loader or a tractor to scoop underneath them. They need to be on something to get them up a little bit. That's what I was wondering. Yep. So we try to keep a pal under them, but not necessarily always mounted. Cool. So awesome. Well, where to next? Uh, we will transition over to, well, we'll see if we see any cattle mm -hmm. as we're uh, head or, heading towards the sheep. So one thing I will say, loading pigs out on pasture, I don't know how you guys do it, mm -hmm. but we have a hydraulic trailer mm -hmm. uh, that we're able to come out here. And with poly wire, we can just cut the po put post in, mm -hmm. step in post, cut the poly wire right where the trailer, back into the trailer is, and just open the gate, throw some feed in, and then they just all run in the trailer. They just close the gate behind them, and then mm -hmm. you've got your pigs and sort off any ones you don't want. And uh, completely stress free. Where does the well, the hydraulic come into play? What is that part? I, I'm not familiar with that. So basically, it's a it's a 16 foot trailer that hydraulically goes up and down. Gotcha. So it hooks onto a tractor. We can just back right up here, so it's right at the ground level, so they're not stepping much on to something. If my colleague Christine is watching this, or whenever you're watching this, Christine, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you got I would you not your... raise pigs without a hydraulic trailer. I wouldn't. We do in the ramp, and uh, we, we know, I think we do a ramp, and um, sometimes we'll, we'll, sort, we'll run them through the corral just yep. to make it easier, easier. you know? Yeah. Um, and that works okay. But uh, I can see I can see uh, a hydraulic trailer being the next. Yeah, level. because all we have to do is just uh, take a tractor and remove the feeder the night before we want to load, mm -hmm. and then just have the, the the hydraulic trailer here with feed in it. Yeah, and throw a bucket in and. Next morning, they're they're, they're they just are in there. for you. They're in there. You just close <laughs> it. And they don't even know what happened. That's super cool. So. All right, you guys enjoying these um, the the side by side right here? Let us know if you're enjoying the ride as much as we are. Um, okay, I'm going to take some of you guys' questions now while we're driving. Okay. Aegis Lumen asked a great question um, about how long is the rest for your pastures on average and your stocking rate shows for pigs. So for the hogs, we only want to hit one one time a year. Yeah. Because they're just that destructive. Yeah. I wouldn't say destructive, hard on the land if right. you leave them too much. Yep. Uh, too much of anything is a bad thing. Did we oh, close the gate? We did not close did the we gate. We close the gate. We're going to close <laughs> the gate now. I'm 
Sorry, there was a second part of that question, I think. Oh, um, thanks, Karen, for reminding us about the gate. Oh, our, nice. our, our, our squad's got our back. They got our back. Right. Um, so rest for pigs is, you know, you do, you said you just run them through a place one time a year. One time a year, yeah. Um, and then the second question was kind of your, your stocking ratios. Okay, yeah. So usually run about um, 50 to 75 in a group per acre. Yeah. And then just move them accordingly however often we need to move them. Gotcha. It's usually what our group size would look like in our pig size. Gotcha, gotcha. You can see here the pigs were out in the woods yeah, they clear earlier the, the year. They clear the can, floor quite nicely. Yeah, you can see exactly where the fence was and wasn't. We generally don't reseed anything. Uh, we'll just naturally come back with whatever's there. Yeah. If we get a pounding rain overnight and a couple couple inches of rain and they work the ground up quite a bit, we'll go ahead and throw some seed on it just to get a, some ground cover uh, coming quickly. And is this like mostly uh, oak, oak trees back here? A lot of walnut. A lot of walnut? A lot of walnut. Okay. In our area. Yeah. And uh, are they like the, these black walnuts that kind of see? Gotcha. Yep. Do, the, do the pigs like those? They do. And yeah. it's, it sounds painful to listen to them eat, <laughs> eat them because it's like rock candy, it yeah. sounds like. And they don't know to you know suck on them or something. They just are a little yeah. kid chewing on it real hard. So. Hey, sometimes I see our pigs just chew on rocks just for the fun of I it. Know. So, you know, they can probably handle a black walnut no problem. Yep. And I'll show you guys what we're talking about here in a little bit. Um, okay, got another question. Um, so Sham Kadari asked, uh, "How do you take care of pigs in the winter?" And actually, we're going to show that later on at the. We're going to show. Stream, yeah, right? we're going to go there uh, after we look at the sheep. We'll so yeah, keep keep watching Sham, and we're going to show you how they're raising pigs in the winter. They got a really awesome, unique setup uh, that I'm super excited to see. Um, thanks, Rick, for reminding us about the gate. And we got another great question from Ling Yang. He said, uh, do you run anything behind the pigs for like rotational grazing? Are you, are you intentionally following the paddocks in any way with uh, behind the pigs? Um, not really. After the pigs, we're gonna let it go through a pretty good rest period. So probably, you know, 60 to 100 day rest period to let the pasture really come back. And then it's gonna be a ruminant animal, whether it's sheep, cattle, okay. something like that. Gotcha, okay. We got a little bit of cattle here. Speaking of cattle. So we will generally have um, a couple hundred head of finishers on the farm at once. Mm -hmm. um, we usually get those in the spring mm -hmm. and we bring them in as um, about 800, 900 pounders. So we buy from farms more in the south um, where they can have an earlier calving season so that we can have calves that will finish by fall our goal is to not overwinter mm -hmm. more than you know a third of what we buy or a quarter of what we buy in the spring mm -hmm. so we want them out before the cost of that maintaining that animal or cost of gain goes up with stored forages um, that we've had to make gotcha so we like to bring them in at that eight to nine hundred pound range and the end of april they'll spend the summer here grazing and rotating here on the farm, eating grass and whatever else we have in our forages. And then by the um, by this time of the year, we're harvesting out of that group. Mm -hmm. And by December, January, most of them will be gone. Gotcha, I gotcha. Might yeah. we take a little closer look just real yeah, quick? Absolutely. So this is actually a, uh, a small cow herd that we, that we ended up having too many um, uh, from a timing standpoint, too many fat cattle uh, last year. So I, I mm -hmm. bred some of these, um, about 30 of them, and I let them calve out. And we won't, we don't intend to keep them. Uh, gotcha. we, don't, we don't raise any, we don't have a cow calf herd, basically. So we, okay. but even though we, we do have them this year, it's yeah. not in the long term plan. So. Okay, gotcha. And then um, I guess uh, how, how many cattle are you guys usually finishing on the farm? So we're usually finishing 150 to 200 gotcha. um, a year. Okay, yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Yeah. Well, they're a little shy this morning, so we'll let them get back to breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> so we just we just uh, scanned our cattle yesterday, um, our finishing herd, to uh, kind of identify the ones that are um, gonna have good marbling, 
that are maybe the ones that are close to finish. Yeah. Also, you're yeah. looking for some stress. I think you guys have done done that. Yeah, you said you guys worked with Clay Nash, right? Yeah, he was here yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we got a video on our channel if you guys are curious to learn more about how um, how you can scan a cow a cow basically to check, do exactly what Blake's talking about. You know, see see what the marbling is looking like, see how the muscle development is going. And, yeah. Um, you guys can see all about how that process works. So you can check out that other video on our channel. I really like it because it allows us to be able to identify um, which animals are either really uh, performing well mm -hmm. and which animals maybe are not performing as well. Maybe some are stressed and you'll see that in there. And the tenderness and the toughness will be, uh, will be shown through that process. So you may be thinking about um, you know, cutting that animal up differently, maybe going to a different uh, customer. Yep. So for us, when you uh, have maybe some meat shops or some butcher shops that you're working with, we always tend to want to give uh, everybody our best animal. And when it comes to working with a meat shop, you want to you give them your best animal. But sometimes by doing that, if you can't consistently give them that same quality, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. For right. Because, um, you know, if you sell that first one to them and it's amazing, that's the expectation they have all the time. Yeah. So what I can do is go through the data after we scan them and I can just say, all right, I know what our average is going to be and I can consistently get this type of quality carcass to this customer. Then that expectation, I can meet that expectation every time. Gotcha. Going for a little ride, going for a little dip here. A little dip. We're nice. Going crossing the river here. Well, it's just a beautiful property out here. It's really amazing. Yeah, I uh, really enjoy being outside. Can't believe I get to do this for a living. Yeah, man, <laughs> absolutely. When we do our customer tours, we do a wagon ride, and we actually bring them down to do here. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, one of the highlights. That's awesome. for us. Um, we got our first use last February uh -huh. and they started lambing pretty much immediately and they lambed all the way through May. So our goal is to get everything lambing in the May time frame but we wanted to buy about 600 ewes and I put a bigger emphasis on them coming from one one location, one farm versus the timing, uh -huh. uh, because I didn't want to mix a bunch of flocks together to get the amount of ewes that I wanted. So uh, we kind of compromised with the with the uh, the lambing season because yeah. we can correct that in one in one year. Uh -huh. Hope you guys can see them, but they are back there. There are probably little white spots on your screen. Um, but what what breeds are you guys running? So these are uh, it's a Dorper commercial uh -huh. Dorper. Gotcha. Uh, cool. Dorper flock and uh, so why sh why sheep? What made you guys want to start sheep? So uh, I've always liked sheep. I feel like they've had a place on our on our farm, and the fact that we can kind of run them uh, with the cattle as well, uh, they complement each other. Um, and then we also have a solar project that's developing um, just a couple miles from here. It's about a thousand acres, mm -hmm. and uh, we've been in uh, talks with them about. Um, you know, the likelihood of being able to keep agriculture a part of that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's something that is happening all across the country and the world, really. Yeah, we've been discussing it, too, at our place, because there's you. a good symbiosis there with using the sheep to manage the forage yes. around the solar panels, right? Yeah, yeah there is. So, gotcha. so that's kind of our, our, kind of our long-term goal with them. Uh, and, you know, learning to graze under solar panels is going to be challenging enough and then we've never raised sheep before. I mm -hmm. don't want to try to learn sheep and grazing solar panels all the same year. Mm -hmm. So solar panels could be, you know, three to five years out, mm -hmm. but I want to get our flock here and get them established and just uh, learn, make those mistakes here on our farm that initially you will make with a new yeah. with a new species on the farm. Yeah, we, so. we, we've been running them for a long time out at our place. and. Um, 
you got some good people on staff and we're actually in the process right now of making an online course all about how we run our sheep operations start to finish and oh, nice. really like going super in depth it's going to take us probably a year to make the course make we're the put, course. putting that much effort into wow. it wow that's, that's fantastic we need material out there like that because yeah. like i'm excited i'm ready to sign yeah, up yeah <laughs> so. yeah that, that, that's what we notice is that there's just a gap of, yeah. of stuff like that there's a lot of videos people can find but yep. you know to have everything all in one place and to go as in depth as we're going into this thing yeah. i mean it's going to be a master class all about production and so yep. uh, but yeah it's a great enterprise uh, we really enjoy raising them yeah and, and they're and they're safe so you can bring in new team members and they can start working with the sheep a lot quicker than they could working with the cattle you've got to you know the flight zones are different with with cattle and and uh and just the, the physical size of them um, mm -hmm. can make them cattle more dangerous than to work with sheep so awesome um well, so think... we're excited we're excited about the sheep i think they have a future we don't sell a lot of sheep so a lot of lamb that we sell online um we'll have to either up that say those sales somehow or mm -hmm. sell on the commercial market so let me ask you about that you want to keep keep yeah. driving i think the sheep have abandoned us but yeah they um, have <laughs> i had, we had a question earlier um let me see if i can find it somebody asked about um they said from a fall, uh, it was Mad Acre Farms. They said from a small farm perspective, how did you grow your customer base? Oh, that's, that's so it's kind of related to what you're talking about, about acquiring customers for a new enterprise. So just from your perspective, you know, what are one or two things that, that could really help? Yeah, well, I think one is identifying like who is your ideal customer. Mm -hmm. um, and once you've got that figured out, then position your farm to be found. So whether that's, you know, you can have a website but uh, you still have to market your website. You still have to let people know that your website exists. So mm -hmm. whether that's through social media, um, whether it's through farmer's markets, um, it can be a, an avenue of a multiple different things. But at the end, you need to keep pointing them to the direction you want them. So mm -hmm. if it's a farmer's market, that's your first point of contact maybe. Um, the second point would be, hey, join our, our newsletter, email, sign up, uh, follow us. Um, somehow get them part of your ecosystem and mm -hmm. then if there's anything you can do to just make that experience of buying from you unbelievably enjoyable um, buying from a farm is uh, can be very inconvenient because farms are just located not where the customers are that's mm -hmm. just the nature of it so how can you make uh, buying from you convenient and fun um, so whether that's through home delivery, uh, whether you're doing it personally, the deliveries, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the conventional way of selling quarters and halves can be cumbersome. So can you think about ways of like just making bundles, taking away the, the hanging weight because most people know what hanging weight is. Mm -hmm. So things like that to make that process, um, you know, as less friction as possible. Yeah, um, no, that, that's great advice. I think that's awesome. You know, and, and just uh, being comfortable with, uh, Showing people your farm, putting it on uh, social media, talking going, about it. Going live, you going, know, going un live. Unedited. unedited. Yeah, that's how you know this is the real deal, you guys. I mean, we're, this this video is as, as live as it gets, and they literally are not filtering anything. They're showing me everything that they possibly can. Um, you know, there's, there's complete transparency here at their farm. No shame whatsoever, and uh, I think you can see why pretty clearly. Um, they're really proud of what they're doing and, and with good reason. So where are we headed to next? So we are headed to see the, the winter uh, set up for the hogs. Oh, okay, cool, perfect. Um, we're just getting ready to, we actually have a group of pigs uh, in one of the buildings already. And we'll be slowly migrating uh, all the other herds to the buildings. Same way with the chickens, we're in that time period where once the weather starts getting cold enough where your water lines start freezing outside yeah yeah because um, you guys get freezing temperatures quite a bit through the winter i imagine oh yeah oh yeah so we're supposed to get uh, we're supposed to be down to 32 in the i think three or four nights from now so gotcha that makes it challenging and with chickens laying hens uh the access to water uh, all the time is super important to the lay rate so we're very particular about when we start moving them in. We don't want to move them in too late. They go a couple hours. It's like it's like a, a dairy farmer. You know, they be, they can see the result of their management the next day or that same day in the, in the milk tank. When you're raising grass-fed 
of beef or grass-fed lamb or something like that, or even hogs, uh, you don't see that result the next day. The animal still may you know, have the effect from it, but uh, you don't see it. So in dairy and in, in laying hens, it's a lot easier to uh, to know where you need to focus because you see the, the, the positive or negative to your management really fast. basically 10 to 12 acres in each paddock and um, this first one here just kind of has the, the kind of some steel huts you see I've got that one flipped over there yeah they work they work generally pretty well yeah um, they, they keep the hogs warm but it still can be a challenge to get out to bed them all the time and, uh, and then plus the hogs will come in the feeders the hog feeders um, out in the elements, so it makes it a little challenging. So we built these, basically the greenhouses, yeah. stationary greenhouses, and the hogs will spend about four months out of the year in these buildings, access to these buildings, and then we just rotate the hogs through the 12 acres that each building has assigned to it. Each building has the what? So they, so we got. The, the 12 acres is encompasses one building, so we'll just do a wagon wheel with poly wire around each one of the buildings. Okay, so wait, continue, you're moving these or? Continue to move them, yeah. You move these buildings? Not the buildings, I'm sorry, the wire. So the hogs I will see. go out the end, of the end of the buildings. Let's go take a look. So you got some guardian dogs? Yep, this but. one. Enjoys being with the pigs. <laughs> is that an Akbash? Akbash? Or? That is a uh, hey, Great hey. Pyrenees. Nice, nice. Great Pyrenees. But you can see, so they're just deep bedded with, we use hay, like a, a good hay, um, not a great hay, but like a first cutting hay or straw. Mm -hmm. And we have the, uh, it's a dark tarp. It's not, doesn't let any light in. It's not white because that can be uh, let a little bit too much sunlight in. Mm -hmm. And the buildings will actually get pretty warm. So even like in December and January, if it gets to a, maybe a 40 degree day, 50 degree day, and the sun's out, mm -hmm. um, it'll get 70, 80 in there. Mm -hmm. So we'll use the blackout tarp um, just so that we can monitor the temperature better. Gotcha. And these have we have roll up doors on each end, so we get airflow going through. We have a um, a uh, energy free water in the center where the hogs can get uh, access to water and it usually it never freezes because we've got the, the building over it. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a, um, an auger system as well. So we can run in the winter time about 150, these buildings are 30 by 200, so we can run about 150 to 200 uh, hogs per building mm -hmm. at one time. And then we have this auger system, it's a two inch flex auger uh -huh. that anything, um, a, uh, a, a, a commercial building would have something very similar to this. So. Um, anyway, we can take some efficiencies and add them to our model. We're going to do that mm -hmm. as much as possible. So this allows us to get feeders all the way down the 200 foot building and still be able to utilize it. Or else we would have to have either a way to drive through it or um, access holes in the top, which is how we do our um, some of our, our movable buildings for the, the chickens. We, we'll see later today. We fill them from the top. Okay. Um, then this just runs off of a generator. So. We just fill this bin full feed, and then we have a generator here that we run probably two times a week for mm -hmm. um, three, four hours a day. So the generator supports yeah. snow. Yeah, something, something simple because gotcha. we don't have power out here. Yeah. If I had more time, which I still want to do, is get a solar setup. Yeah. Um, for this. Yeah. And uh, so, for folks who might not know, that's a little pig hut. <laughs> it's a little pig hut <laughs> compared to this uh, massive pig yeah. hut. And this works as uh, a shield for a your shield generator. for the generator when nice. uh, we have uh, rain or something like that. Oh, that's super cool. So, but yeah, so then we can just, the pigs will have access all winter out here, and we can just put ply wire just like we do in the summertime, and we just rotate them around. They'll usually make about two trips uh, through the winter. Hey, Max. Hey, how buddy. How are you? Hi. You want some of this, huh? Yeah, you do. <laughs> 
So they'll make two trips through it, and then in the springtime, we'll go in with like oats or peas, something like that, get something growing really quickly, and then come through with the sheep and cattle during mm -hmm. the summer months and graze that off and try to cycle those nutrients as quick as possible. Nice, awesome. Yeah, so they got, uh, got their big hood, got access to the nice pasture, pretty good deal. So it's woven wire all the way around with a hot wire about um, eight inches to a foot off the ground. That way it's just good and secure for mm -hmm. the for the winter months. If we get heavy snow, we don't have to worry about the wire, the hot wire smashed down. We've got the wolf and wire behind it that's gonna keep the pigs in no matter what. So. Cool, yeah, good good solid back fence there. Yeah. Uh, we can we can walk inside this one real quick if yeah. you wanna see. Yeah, we'd love to. This one's You guys wanna go inside? This one's empty, it's got uh it's getting set up for uh for the next batch of hogs. So we lined the building with uh, three-quarter plywood just to keep the, the hogs off of it uh, because they, they would tear the plastic. Yeah. And then we just run a hot wire um, alongside of the, the plywood yeah. because the pigs will just, any, any crack they get, they'll just start peeling away that plywood yeah. and you're replacing that. So we just keep hot wire all the way through it and just raise it as the bedding raises um, throughout the winter in here. And then about every 15 feet, we have a downspout for feed to drop. So we can kind of decide if we want to split it up into two, three sections, we can do that and then turn on and off um, the downspouts to fill the feeders. Okay, uh, how, so you, you can you can turn each one on or off? Yeah, just pull these strings. Um, it's supposed to be a red or green ball attached to these. Yeah. But you can just pull them and then turns them on and off. Cool. And uh, yeah, we've got our water, our water down here. But uh, uh, do you have a water and you have a water line running like a permanent line running in here? We do. We have a permanent line running in here, going to the other building, and uh, we've got about ten miles of buried water line. Yeah. On the farm, and yeah, you never want access to uh, to water to determine how you're going to graze. Yeah. Um, because it's either water or fencing determines how you manage your livestock. Mm -hmm. And if you're um, struggling with either one of those, you're not going to be able to manage the land how you want to manage the land. Mm -hmm. So, the access to water, that's generally never excuse for how we you know didn't get to do, manage the land the way we wanted to um, if we ran out of step in post or poly wire there's just no excuse for that you should always have enough to be able to manage um, manage the land the way you want to and then to tell me a little bit about this water right here yeah so this is energy free so basically it gets this heat from the ground so mm -hmm. there's a big sets on a big hole that goes down about four feet and it's nice and wide we put a concrete pad on top of it this this water then sits on top we got an on-off valve in there, so we can turn it on or off if we need to, if we got to work on it. And you don't have any problems with it freezing? No problems at all, especially in the building. Staying um, in here, nice staying and warm. Staying in here, it's never froze. This will be our fourth winter using these, and it hasn't hasn't froze yet. I've had a couple freeze outside if you don't have enough hogs on them um, to keep the water flowing, but these, I haven't had any problems inside. Awesome, that's pretty cool. This is pretty awesome setup here. I like this a lot. It, it's simple, it's yeah. simple. And the thing is, I think we had, uh, about 30,000 between the two buildings. So there, this was four years ago, so I know material's gone up since then. Total uh, cost for total the cost, two buildings the here. Two buildings, including the um, feed the augers. augers. The feed augers, yeah. yeah. We had, the, we had the, uh, the, the feeder bins outside there already on the farm, so we just relocated them here. So overall cost for the amount of hogs you can run through them, it pays for itself. And, and it, keep, it and lets, you, lets you keep going all, all winter long. And, and if you're not yeah. in an extreme winter environment, you don't, need, no need, you don't need something no. like this. Like we're in Arkansas and yeah. folks can see on our channel how we raise pigs in the winter. We did a live stream, you can go check out that video. It's called Raising Pigs in the Winter. Yeah. And uh, you know, we don't quite have to go to this extent because we don't have the same level of freezing yeah. temperatures you guys have. And we can get away with using the big huts and hay bedding and yeah. you know, just deep bedding those, those big huts out. Yeah. But, that's where location, the context matters. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and so, you want to be able to have, uh, we want to be able to have uh, product year round to our customers. And that's another reason how you can keep customers is as long as you have product, you know, you don't give them a reason to go somewhere else to, mm -hmm. to have to purchase it. But if you run out, there's a great reason why that customer now has to buy from somebody else. Yeah, yeah, no, this is unique. I've never seen anything like this. It lets you still, still do your operation with integrity, access to pasture, you know, doing all those things that uh, make the product uh, as the quality that yeah. that you guys are delivering, yep. so that's uh, really cool. And then what's the what's the trough here? Just to... uh, we had some sheep when the sheep were in here. Oh yeah, I yeah. threw some mineral in here. Yeah, so, nice. So. 
What did yeah. you, you put them in here for again? The sheep? Well, when they were grazing the uh, the uh, the pasture around the outside this summer. Oh, okay. So. Gotcha. Yep. So, um, so we've seen some dogs on the property. Um, An organic gal asked, you know, she, or she said she loves the livestock guardian dogs, and some folks were curious about your um, dogs, just how many you guys have, what you use them for, what your experience has been with yes. your livestock dogs. So we have, uh, I'm not sure how many dogs we have. <laughs> Somewhere probably around 10 mm -hmm. um, guard dogs. So we've got some with uh, some with the hogs, a bunch with the, um, with, with the, the laying hens. We trying to incorporate them into the sheep, but uh, didn't have a great great year this year with with the sheep and the dogs. Um, but they're they're solely here to protect the the animals that they're with. So and the main ones are the laying hens. So we have uh, we have them with them year round. We'll be able to see them in a little bit. The German Shepherd Max running around here. He's just the uh, he's the farm favorite, and he gets to run around wherever he wants. <laughs> so. Nice, awesome. All right, where to next? We will uh, drive down the road here a little ways to see the pastured laying hens. Okay. And uh, we're gonna, my brother Bruce is gonna join us. Okay, let me s switch one thing real quick. Okay. Let's yeah. change my. All right. Yep. All right. Pastured laying hens, and um, you said uh, you got a unique winter set up for them too, right? We do something something similar to this, only it's uh, obviously set up more for the, the laying hens, but utilizes this, trying to utilize the same uh, same material for the buildings. That way, yeah. we can repurpose it. The neat thing about these buildings are you can, if you wanted to take them down, you can take them down and move them somewhere else. Yeah. So. And then you guys are keeping the hay bales out here for just the bedding mostly? That's the bedding. Yep. Keep, keep them warm? Yep. Do you find that they're consuming much of it? Um, I think they consume 10 to 15% of the hay. Yeah. Um, and I use, I like to use hay because they do get a little roughage that way with it. Go up, go. Awesome. Hey, Wilson Gomez from West Palm Beach. Thanks for watching. Uh, AJK, appreciate you watching. He said, uh, Pyrenees Mountain Dogs were brought to the USA by Lafayette. Awesome, thanks for sharing that info. Um, Rick Thelian asked if you have any type of uh, composting system for any of the waste that you guys have out here. So we do compost any of the manure that we gather up. Um, it's not super sophisticated. We don't put a lot of effort into it, but we usually just turn it a couple times a year and then spread in the following year. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for that great question, Rick. Yeah, Organic Gal, so glad you're enjoying the tour. Keep watching. We're going to go ahead and check out those chickens right now, I believe. And Joe Ashley, so glad that you are able to join us live all the way from Horse Cave, Kentucky. Appreciate you guys watching. If you're just joining us, this is the Great American Farm Tour number five. We are live in Roanoke, Indiana at Seven Sons Farm, hanging out with Blake today. I feel pretty fortunate to have you guys here today. Oh man, we're, we're so glad to be here. Like this is this is just incredible. So this is where I live. I, I'm fortunate enough to live on the farm. Awesome. So we're on the, the far west end of our property. We started this morning on the far east side. So. Very cool. Yep. Does, does most of the family live on or around the farm? Uh, we live fairly close within, uh, I think everybody's pretty much within four or five miles. Because uh, for those who don't know, the farm is called Seven Sons Farm, and yes, there are seven sons, correct? There are seven there, sons. There are I'm, seven. I'm the oldest of the seven, so I've got six six younger brothers. Yeah. And uh, we all work on the farm. And, awesome. And uh, focus in on different areas. Yeah, very cool. Hey, El Mary in Starkville, Mississippi, so glad you're watching. Hope you're enjoying the tour today. Hang tight, guys. We're just headed over to uh, check out their laying in operations. And you guys, you won't want to miss this there. It's going to be uh, pretty incredible. I've seen some pictures and videos, and if you've never seen it before, it's pretty, pretty amazing operation. I mean, if, if you saw
saw the beginning of the live stream, you, you saw where they were washing and packing there. How many eggs? 15,000 a day, what'd you say? Yeah, we gather anywhere from, uh, I think, 10 to, 10 to 12,000 eggs that we gather a day. 10 to 12,000 eggs. So if you missed this, if you're just joining us or came in halfway through, go back and watch the beginning of this live stream and you can see uh, where they were washing all the eggs. And uh, now we're gonna go check out um, where they were all laying. So I got a question, um, let's see, let's see if I can answer this one. Cole Kadiro asks, how big is the farm? And I think you said it's 500 acres, right? 500 and, acres, yeah. Managing 500 acres on the farm. Uh, Ling Yang asks, as far as water, are you using a pressurized well to feed the lines or is it public utility line? So it's all pressurized wells. I think there's uh, four different wells that we utilize on the property. Um, and it's worked out pretty well. There's a couple, couple ponds that we're able to strategically pull out of, but for the most part it's all, all pressure as well. Awesome. Then what, what are we looking at out at this pasture? Is it the neighbor's property or are you, are you guys managing this? I'm sorry, what'd you say now? What are we looking at out over Soybeans. here? Soybeans. Soybeans. Gotcha. Soybeans, yep. So that would be, be like the conventional farm. Yeah, uh, so this course, is the neighbor's property? The neighbor's property, corn soybean rotation. Gotcha, so that, that's the alternative, that's the difference. I mean, you can uh, manage one thing like this, or you can manage five or six different things like you guys are on your property. And um, you guys said you're, you, you're using some soy in your product. Is that, do you know where that's where the different feed sources come from? Yeah, so the, the soy comes from a couple farms in Michigan. We're close enough to Michigan. Yeah, um, just across can, the border. Yeah right across the line there, so uh, a couple of farms from there, and there's a uh, extruder up there that does extrusion for, for us, and uh, then the corn comes from, actually, um, from two farms right in our area. One, uh, one gentleman actually works for us part-time, and then farms uh, some row crops for delivery on his farm, so we buy the non gmo corn from him. Awesome. It works Very out cool. great, we can support him as well. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. I don't know if you see one of these with drive over gates. No. Oh, you need one. Let me let me uh, make sure I get this demonstration here. So this is the chicken farm. Uh-huh. It's like 90 acres and we're in and out of here constantly. I'm gonna show people while you do it if you don't mind. It's probably gonna catch and grab something off today. <laughs> well we'll have the memory to last forever. Yeah, we will. <laughs> if you hit it on an angle with a smaller vehicle, it works pretty good. Roll back up like that's that. Handy. That's it handy. That's handy. That's nice. You got to be careful. Uh, certain vehicles, if there's something under them, will snag on here. I think that we can make this a little better so where it doesn't catch. We've yeah. already flipped that angle iron over. That's so pretty it cool. Because sometimes when you're not here four, five, six times a day, it's hard to be motivated to close the gates every single time. <laughs> but you still need to. Yeah. Uh -huh. And it's just because the chickens 
they create those dust pockets everywhere or the yeah. dust bay. Yeah. And uh, it, it makes the land a little rough where we consistently have chickens. But I mean, the, the pasture itself looks great, you know? Yeah, oh. and we figure that we're getting about four ton to the acre of chicken litter just by having them out here rotating. Yeah. Uh, rotating through the, through the field. Oh my gosh, hope you guys are still with us because this is pretty cool. We'll make sure Bruce got the fence off. This, this is a next level layer operation. Fence is off. Fence is off, all right. Okay, cool. Thanks, sir. Hey, Pokey. All right. Um, do you want to switch mics or how do you want to do that? Um, yeah, let's just go ahead and switch because I think, Bruce, you're going to be able to answer some of these questions. You can also, um, here, let me do this. We'll try this. Kennedy, you let me know if this works out. Um, you guys can just pass this back and forth if you want. Just kind of hold it. Yep. Should be okay. We'll see how the wind does. Yeah. But uh, you guys let us know if the audio sounds all right. Um, I'm going to get on this side of you real quick. Okay. So. In introduce yourself to our audience here yeah, and tell good. me what's going on yep. today. Uh, my name is Bruce Hitzfield. I'm the sixth son here. Uh, since it's been about seven years now, I got into the Lane Hen Enterprise. I've um, been doing it ever since. My brother and I, Bryce, were doing it earlier on. Um, since then, we've had a few things come up. He, he grew a sister company called Hen Gear, and I kind of took over with the production side. So, yeah, we've been growing every year, really. Um, yep. When I started in, I think we had 6,000 hens, I believe. Four, or maybe it was five. Uh -huh. now, we're now running between 13 to 16,000, depending upon the transition of flocks. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome. And what uh, what breeds do you guys got to have out uh, here? Mostly just two. It's a Highline or Lowman Brown. Mm -hmm. Highline Brown or Lowman Brown. Um, we choose those. They're obviously a hybrid. We choose the high, high line specifically because they're known for uh, their versatility in pasture-based systems. Uh -huh. um, some of the other breeds just uh, won't hold up as well. Um, some of the just harsher environments um, yeah. with the winter, and they're just, just quite frankly, just not as smart as a bird when it comes to versatility. So. Cool. Yep. Well, let's check it out. What do you want to show us? Well, we can we can walk right into these buildings, show the show the housing environment for these hens. Absolutely. So basically we, we come with a tractor and we're moving these buildings um, basically every day throughout the, the summertime. Just we're hooking up to this cable here on the ground. Yep. We're just gonna pull these buildings. So like the next move would be 50 feet this way. Mm -hmm. Not a whole lot of room here, but then we're gonna come around and go back towards the winter building. But, yep. uh, so yeah, everything in here, they got they got everything they need. They got the, the nesters along the wall. Nesters along the wall, they got feed in here, yeah. down the center, water lines um, underneath these nesters. Uh, where's the water line? Right underneath. Right okay. Right here. Yep. Underneath down there. Yep. yep. Gotcha. Yep. They Inside and, inside and outside. Yep. Yeah, oh, on, oh that's on, pretty clever. It's yeah. on both both walls, going all the way down. Let me, let me show. Line. Let me show folks that just so they can see it yep. real quick. Um, so you got your water on your nipple waterers. Is that what that is? Yep, that's a horizontal nipple. Okay, yep. and it's right there on the edge. So when you raise up your your sides there, they yep. can easily still get to the yep. water. That's yep. really clever. I like that. Yep. Yeah. Right now the wall's down a little. We have some cold nights. Just trying to keep them out of that wind. Mm -hmm. so. yep. Lined with nesting boxes. Yep. Yeah, these are these are nesting boxes that. So I talked about Bryce. He fired up that sister company called Hang Gear. Uh, we started designing these nest boxes. Uh, what was that four or so years ago? Um, so yeah, all the nesting boxes here is uh, boxes that we design, mm -hmm. roll out design. So basically, we'll come in here. Uh, One o'clock each day is our start time for gathering. We clear the hens out. And basically, just open up this tray. We got the eggs in here. We're just coming through with a basket and flats gathering through this, this building so you hand yeah. gathering them all hand gather yep. okay hand -gather. nice these are these are timers programmed to uh basically release this mechanism the next morning at 5 a.m that way we don't have to come out every day in the and, morning and what, what's the nesters. point of doing that exactly to keep, to keep those hens out of there keep those nest pads clean keep okay you know, that so makes sense sleep in there at night gotcha yep. awesome 
How's the audio, guys? Let us know. Yeah, if I'm it's, just gonna ask. Let us know if it's loud in here. If you guys can hear us, okay. The chickens want to be heard. They yeah. do. They do. This is their moment in the sun. Yep. Yeah. Bruce, why don't you talk about the solar lighting in here and how important that is? Yep. Yeah. So right here is our battery bank in there. We got lights going down here. We're just trying to keep 16 hours of light for the hens. Mm -hmm. um, hens need the light stimulation to stay within their uh, get their egg production. You know, hens in the winter time oftentimes will go into a molt. And it's just because of shorter days in the winter. Uh huh. Um, so yeah, we're just trying to sustain that 16 hours. And we're using solar out here. We're obviously not on the grid. So basically, just a few hours in the morning, a few hours in the evening. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, because in the winter time, especially, you guys have a lot yeah. less daylight. Yeah. 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 And then, and then these are your. Those are, that's the feed system. It's basically just a gravity fed system. We'll come. We'll come in here with our. Uh, Grain cart. Yeah, we and, saw it earlier. Yeah, okay. Yeah. We'll just auger it on down. There's there's openings at the top. We're just augering on down. These six feeders are 300 pounds each. Um, that'll last a week. So we feed once a week in here. Wow. I think we'll step, step out here just real quick. Yep. Folks said the chickens are loud. They can hear us, all right? The chickens are loud. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, we're in their peak hour of lay, so they're noisier at this time. Oh, okay, so they're they're hard at work. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> yep. And uh, do you find that they stick mostly to those nesting boxes? Are they doing their jobs where they're supposed to, or do you have any Generally issues with speaking, that? Generally speaking, um, that's that is a management. If you have if you have a lot of ground eggs, that's a management issue for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. We're obviously just trying to mitigate uh, things that would make them want to lay on the ground. Um, you know, hens want to feel safe and comfortable when they're laying their eggs. So we're trying to keep everything lifted. No no cozy corners, dark spots on the ground. Um, sometimes the pasture can really grow and that, that can cause issues, but that's why we got cattle here and we'll, we'll try to keep it um, grazed down. Mm -hmm. but, uh, that's specifically a problem right when the hens go into lay, mm -hmm. around 20 weeks. Mm -hmm. So just have to be extra careful around that timeline to train them into those nesting boxes. Gotcha. That, that's a, that's something that keeps us on our toes every year with every new flock. Yeah. And you think you get it figured out, and then there's another new variable. But, yeah. Yeah, that's. And uh, let, let me show. I'm gonna show kind of the, uh, the 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 top of your schooners here, just real quick. Yep. Um, because that's kind of unique. And tell me how you're loading those up. Yeah. So we're just gonna basically just drive right into here with the grain cart. Auger comes out. We're gonna hit those hit those openings up there. You good. Just gonna hit those openings, auger it straight down on in. It's just a gravity fed system. So mm -hmm. a lot of people use the, the auger line setup. Uh -huh. I've looked into that multiple times. I tried to reprice it, recoil it over and over, and every single time it really just doesn't, it doesn't Didn't work out very well for us with, with what we have here. Yeah. Um, to be honest, the issue is that these buildings aren't long enough to justify the electronics, the motor for each building. It, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't pay off for what we're able to do with this system. Awesome. So, awesome. Let me just check in here and see. Am I missing anything, Blake? How much, uh, so we got a question here from Jeff Dixon. He's watching in Cambodia today, and he wanted to know uh, how much feed you guys use for this operation here. Ooh, well, it's, let's see, Blake, you want to pull out your calculator really quick? <laughs> there you go. A uh, quarter pound of feed today? We're about 0.26 a day, times that by 14,000 hens. How, how much per bird a day, you said? Point, point point two two six, six pounds. Yeah, point two six. Okay. Right now, I guess no. The average is probably probably about point two eight, because the winter time is going to go up. Cooler mm -hmm. months are going to consume more feed. Oh so yeah. So let's let's figure for a pasture based system, point two eight pounds per bird, uh, times fourteen thousand, times three sixty five. That's one million four hundred thirty thousand pounds a year. A Good. Lot. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're glad we're not uh, bucketing that by hand. So <laughs> we were. Uh, do, you, do you have like one of the same trucks that we saw earlier with the pigs coming through here? Yeah, the same truck will will come here and fill these. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, another question from Rick Thielen. He said, um, "How long do your hens usually lay before you, you kind of rotate them out?" Yep, yeah, we're on a one year and one year out cycle. Okay. So give or take. Um, 
it can be like 11 to 13 months on the farm. Mm -hmm. um, that will mostly depend upon just what our, our sales cycle is like. Um, you know, for, for heavier on eggs, I might get rid of that flock a little bit sooner. It just kind of depends on timing with transition of flocks when I'm able to get a new flock in. Yeah. But it's generally a year. Okay. Yeah. And uh, can you kind of just point out and show me where all your different schooners are just so yep. people can see a total size of just, because yep. it's not just these two that we're standing yeah. in between right here. There's 11, 11 schooners, or we call them mobile coops. Okay. Uh, there's yep. four here. We got 40, 4,600 hens in this flock, so basically about 1,000 hens per building. And then we got another flock over there. Okay, yeah. Over there, you got uh, seven, uh, seven more. Well, yeah, it's two different flocks. There's three buildings, this is another flock, and then those four buildings is another separate flock. And um, we keep all of our flock separate. We don't combine any any different ages. Oh yeah, that makes sense. So. Gotcha. And then uh, what, what what do you do when when they're done laying? So when they're done laying, um, basically they just get sold to backyarders um, mm -hmm. and um, anyone that wants to have them as like a stew meat. In the past, we've sold them on our website um, as stew stewing hen. Oh, yes, stew bird. Yeah. Nice. So, awesome. Yeah. And how, how do you how do you get the? Do, I guess do people just know that? Uh, they can contact Seven Sons if they want some layer hens. Yep. Gotcha. Yep. yep. Yeah, I have I have a contact list. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, it must be a mile long, or at least you got some good people on it. No, that's pretty cool. So if you guys are in the area, if you're watching and uh, you're looking for some good laying hens, uh, some second year Seven Sons birds probably do the trick for you. Yeah. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit about the importance of keeping the flocks separate and how you track the, the lay rate and things like that? Why not? Yeah, so I guess starting with that, records are important. You got to know a lot about your birds, um, the age, lay rate, even body weight. All these things are very important. You're not going to be able to know what to do with their feed, um, what what their performance should look like mm -hmm. you know, if you don't know these factors. So you got to be got to be tracking all these things. Uh, we found that to be one of the most helpful things for us to really make this a viable operation. Is know know what we're doing out here with the records. We got daily records. Each flock record the egg count. Um, if there's any mortalities, we're keeping track of the total flock number. Um, just there's there's a list. A lot of, of record keeping yeah, going on. A lot of record on. keeping. Um, so yeah, if you have if you have mixed ages, um, you can have a host of different issues. For one, you can't have your one year and one year out cycle because you're going to get rid of some birds too soon. Some not you know soon enough. So yeah, big big issue there. Yeah. Um, the different ages of birds. You don't you don't want to have a you know. A year and a half old bird mixed in with just a year old bird. Right. And they behave quite a bit differently. You can create issues there. Just mm -hmm. you know, every flock has a pecking order. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't you don't want to you don't want to make that worse by mixing ages. Um, yeah. So. So there's one bird out here that is the queen of them all. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. That's awesome. Yep. There is. So. And uh, yeah, so I mean, wh how are you guys keeping those records? Are you just write, writing it down manually? Are you running it's, it's, a spreadsheet? It's all or on our phones. You all we running on your phone? Sheets, yeah. 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 No, that's awesome. Yep. Yeah. Share, it with, share it with the whole team. Everybody has access to it. Mm -hmm. and they just re re make the record right mm -hmm. on the spot. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you guys are watching um, and you're looking for some access to pasture poultry record keeping templates, we got some of those on our YouTube channel and our website where you can download them for free and. Uh, and start keeping records because if you're not, just like Bruce said, um, it's it's incredibly important. Yeah, um, it'd be a nightmare trying to figure out what's going on with 14,000 hens out here. Absolutely, yeah. For, for a lot of farms, the it seems like for a lot of farms, the uh, the pasture uh, laying hen operation is sometimes the least profitable. Mm -hmm. uh, but for us, it's the most profitable production enterprise per acre that we can do. Did did, it, did that happen at a certain scale, or has it always been that way for you guys? So I think it's it's scale and it's lay rate. Um, lay rate, yeah. That's the, why you're doing the birds one year at a time. Those are, those sure are the biggest beat. factors. And uh, Bruce, you might be able to add more to this, but um, you know, going from uh, 65 or 70 percent average lay, lay rate for the year up to an 80 or 75 to 80 that's huge on the profitability yeah. of that that model that's a make or break it's make or break for our models yeah so, no that, that that's what, what lay rate is break even for us that's a great question i think it's all the way down to like 40 percent 40 50 percent 
somewhere down in there. What is that? Uh, 40 to 50 percent. Lay cycle, yeah. lay rate is yeah. our break-even number. Explain that for me. What do you mean exactly yeah, when you so say that's, lay that's rate? That's an interesting question. You just you're, So you're saying on just the direct inputs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I can't answer that off the top of my head, but it's somewhere down in there. Um, but yeah, our average lay rate um, for all the flocks historically is 73 percent. Mm -hmm. 73 percent historically. These, these, a lot of these flocks, when they come in, they can peak at high 80s and sustain that for three, maybe six months. And so that that 73% to 80% of the whole flock is laying once a day, or how, how, how does that calculate? Yeah, how would you word that if you have 73% uh, of them laying each day? Okay. Yeah, yeah I'm just yeah. Trying, to, trying to clarify. That's yeah. close yeah. enough. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. i uh, got a couple of questions. Let me ask you real quick. Um, Dean L. asked about uh, predator issues, aerial, land. Um, what, what kind of predator issues do you guys deal with out here? Yep, so you're always going to have predators in the area. Um, things we do to mitigate that is obviously this electrified netting you see here. Yep. We're not letting the birds roam free. Around. We don't want to let them roam free um, for the predators, and also we don't want the flocks to mix. Yeah. Um, we also have our guard dogs. I don't know if we saw any pulling in here. We've seen a couple on the property yep. hanging out. I think there's like eight here now. I said ten earlier. Ten, quite well, terrible. there's as of yesterday, there's 13 new puppies, so <laughs> there's there's gonna be a lot here. Um, but uh, yeah, the guard dogs are a great tool to mitigate that. The worst thing you can have is. You know, coyotes or wild dogs get in and they just you know, massacre. Yeah, yeah. Areas. What about aerial? You guys have any of those issues? I think we get those every now and then. You, you can mitigate that by just the size of pasture space you give them. Uh -huh. So, like, if these hens had, a, you know, 10 acres of access at once, if this flock did, you're going to have some hens roaming way out there, and that dog's not going to be able to protect that corner and that corner at the same time. Gotcha. So, yeah, you can have a chicken hawk, um, get that every now and then. But to be honest, I, I have not seen... In the last year, since we got like 10 dogs here, I don't see a whole lot of evidence of predation. And generally, the chicken hawk is looking for the that one that drifted too far away. Right, so gotcha. As long as you can keep it, it's like a density, it kind of just keep scares them them away. Yeah. We'll have them, we'll have chicken hawks just kind of rest on the power lines or something close and just watch. You know, they don't feel comfortable enough to jump down in there because yeah. just the massive amount of birds here. Gotcha. So it's intimidating. Um, <laughs> we took a poll to see what people call call these structures. Uh, I'm interested to know this one. <laughs> <laughs> so 38% would call it a mobile coop. Ah, uh, okay. 33% um, says chicken tractor, and I'm, I'm in the minority at 27% with chicken schooner. Schooner. <laughs> right. Thank you guys for participating in that poll. Hope, hope good, good feedback there. So um, mobile coop was the winner? Mobile coop. Yeah. Okay. So they, they're keeping it simple. Okay. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see, Ling Yang asked about the water lines. How are you feeding the water lines? So I guess from your, your well lines out to here, how are you feeding them just with hoses? Well, Blake and I have had a lot of fun putting a lot of water line system throughout <laughs> all of our acreage. Yeah, how many miles did you say you have? Oh, it's well over 10. Yeah, yeah. Yep. gotcha. So this this 90 acre field alone has, well, we got like 1,000 feet times 6,000 6, feet here under underground trenched every 600 feet. So basically you can see these posts going out here. That's a line. Some white posts, yeah, yeah. You got a whole water line out there. Yeah. And then along the corn fence line there, there's another one there. Uh -huh. and over here, there's going to be another one going down the field. Mm -hmm. So Can we walk over and just kind of show that one yeah, right yeah, here? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we were we were talking earlier just about how important having access to water uh, is and yep. How it, you don't want to you don't want it to dictate what you do what you're doing so so we try to keep these stakes up so we know know where our water lines are but yep. when you have cattle and such out here a lot of times they can get knocked over mm -hmm. anyways down in here blaming my cattle <laughs> <laughs> take a peek in there yeah we can we can pull this out so oh that's good we can see all right okay. yep so yeah basically it's just uh, you just plug into that um, mm -hmm. garden hoses from there and then there's a splitter hooking up to all four buildings so when we go to move the buildings we'll just undo the garden hoses at the splitter mm -hmm. and then just pull the buildings so right now you got another one of these down over there yeah, on the back and side. you got a splitter hooked up to it and garden yep. hoses running to each line here yep. right yeah nice yep. nice hey that's a great question link thanks so much for asking that yeah i don't know if they saw in the building on the other end is a water tank it's like a 30 gallon tank and it's just gravity fed from there okay yeah um Another quick question. East Coast 24 asks, where do you buy those hanger um, nest boxes? He loves them. Hanger.com. Hanger.com. Yep. Simple as that. Yeah, simple. simple as that. Yep. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Um, the, the buildings you can also get at Hanger as well. 
Oh, okay. Yep. Do, they, do you all fabricate those on site? Like they come in pieces? or? Yeah, they're going to come on a skid, 12 foot skid, mm -hmm. um, deliver to their property, and then they'll have to manufacture or they'll have to build it up from there. Okay, cool. Yep. Awesome. Guys, this has been incredible, man. I've never seen anything quite like it. And I just can't thank you enough for showing us around uh, your farm today. This is just so cool. Yeah, no, thanks for coming out. So it's fun to share. Absolutely. Um, there's one of the guardian dogs, hey guy? Yep. Doing his job? That one, I believe, is Pete. Pete. Yep. Super cool. Um, let me see if there's any last minute questions from the audience. Um, if you guys got them, get them in now. Um, we could probably just hang out with these chickens all you day. Want to see the winter set up at yeah. all? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh yeah, that's right. Because this this isn't your this isn't your this, winter this, setup. Yeah, this is the summer setup. So actually, this flock and um, the one over there are going over to these winter structures, and we're going to transition them here in about two weeks. Okay. So, and they'll bunker down there for the the winter season. Um, and, and what what kind of temperatures is it when you start hitting those freezing nights? Yeah, when you start to that's, move that's them? Really about it. Yeah. And is it mainly just because you don't your water line issue, or what is water, it? Water line is the biggest issue, mm -hmm. and then obviously. Um, just overall health of the flock out here when it's getting down to that temperature. Isn't it? Gotcha. Are we going to take a ride? Take a ride. All right. And is that is that them over there? Is that what they yeah, are? Those three These buildings here? along the buildings. Awesome. If you go to the middle one, we got hens in there. Okay. Yeah, let's check that out. How big are the buildings, Bruce? They're, they're 30 by 400 feet. Okay. And how many birds about do they fit? Say again. How many birds? Uh, I'd recommend about 4,000. Okay. It's three square foot per bird. So yeah, somebody just actually asked that uh, about the size of the mobile coops back there. Did you mention the size of those? How big are those? Those are 20 by 48. Okay. So 20 feet wide and 48 feet long. Gotcha. That's our solo setup for the each, each, each uh... That's, yeah, that basically it's our energizer uh, on wheels, so we got solar panels charging those batteries in that uh, that uh, container there. Yeah, that's pretty massive, but you guys are running a lot of electric netting. Yep. And, and those netting. bigger nets take quite a bit, right? Yeah, that's an 18 joule energizer in there. Anything mm -hmm. less won't won't keep up for the size of areas that we're, we're setting up. That's a nice How setup. Many do you have these? Three. Yeah. Setup. yeah. Nice. All right. Earlier this spring, we had 100 mile an hour winds come through and took this building down. Oh, the first yeah. One right here. So, yeah. we kind of spent some time rebuilding it. That's been on the, the last couple weeks project. Yeah, that's ready. been on the to do list. Uh, we're just just now finishing it up. The, uh, the skeleton of the uh, previous building still laying out there, but we got it rebuilt, knocked down about 130 feet. 130 feet. We got that replaced, re tarped. Yeah. Is it typical? You guys uh, normally get that strong of wind up here? I can't. Is that wind very typical? No, we no. usually don't get that strong of wind. Yeah. 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 All right. Hands in the winter time. Yeah, so start thinking. Start thinking two feet of snow. Yeah. 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 Zero degrees. Oh, okay, yeah. So here in a couple months, it's going to be like that. Wow. So yeah, this is uh, one of the three winter buildings that we have. It sounds like music in here. Yeah. There for a minute, it sounded like they were singing. I don't know if I'm just losing my mind, but. <laughs> 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 They're much quieter and calmer yeah. in here. Yeah, these birds, uh, I think there's two reasons for that. Um, the age mm -hmm. and the light. Mm -hmm. So these, these girls are just 23 weeks old. They're just now coming into production. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, the birds are going to be more laid back um, when it comes to the noise factor. That's interesting. Before they come into because at this time of day, if they're all laying, they're all going to be squawking, proud of their, their egg they just laid. Because that's so, what was going on over there, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, they're they're a little quieter. Um, this is the first year that we've used black uh, tarp underneath. It's basically it's a bunker cover or mm -hmm. a, a silage cover tarp. Mm -hmm. So um, the concept is just to um, you know, birds are kind of a jungle fowl. They don't want to be in the intense sunlight at all times. So we're trying out this darker tarp mm -hmm. and the mobile coops, mobile buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, 
we use shade cloth, mm -hmm. which works fine. We can't do that here because as soon as it snows, it'll bring down the building because snow does not escape off the cloth. It won't slide off because the no. shade cloth is like mesh yeah, almost, like right? Mesh. And yeah. this, is, this is a lot smoother yeah. so it can melt yeah. off and slide yeah. off. So can't use shade cloth, so we're going to try trying this out. Yeah. And this structure will hold the snow on top of it, yes. no problem with yep. it like that. Yep. Can we walk down just a yep. little bit? I want to yep. show it because this is massive. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. And what, what kind of bedding are you using this in here? This is just wood chips. Just so wood the, chips. The county so you just, guys? They chip them and bring them in. So pull the chips in. It's They got mm -hmm. four or five inches of bedding to, the bridge, to burrow through. You call this the dry side of the building? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So this is specifically set up to help mitigate you know, some of the winter moisture problems that you have trying to get birds through the uh, winter. Humidity is yeah. one of the bigger problems that you'll have. Uh -huh. I have on this side, it's basically just their dust bathing area and their nest boxes. Over here, we got the roost going on down, yeah. and then the feeders, and then the water lines on that wall. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically that's the heavy impact side. The north side of this building is heavy impact. Gotcha. Sun's on the southern hemisphere. We get more drying on this side. Although we got a black tarp on now, so we'll see about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. So it's designed that way so that way they still have you know half this building space to burrow through, dust bathe every day. Mm -hmm. So. And then this side is kind of more the cake area where it's kind of a winter chore. We'll come in here, we'll spread chips over onto this side of the building and just kind of keep that covered, keep the smell down. Mm -hmm. um, just keep you know, mitigating. And do y'all keep the sides down in the winter? That's something that we're, we're watching. It depends on weather patterns every day. Mm -hmm. Every day that changes. So um, generally speaking, though, the walls have to stay up in certain areas. Um, we sell Whole Foods and these, these things need outdoor access and we want them to have outdoor access. Yeah, so, that makes sense. Um, but we also have to mitigate keep, from a cold keep you know, negative 20 windshield coming from the west or northwest and yeah um, that so speaking of that that can lead to some problems with freezing water lines so basically we mitigate that with the walls we've got water line going down this building 400 feet and it's trenched on the way back it's basically a geothermal uh, watering system so in, the, in this in this water room over here we got a, a reservoir over there and in that box. Pump in yeah. There. Uh -huh. yeah, we can go in there in a bit if you want. Okay. But uh, we're basically just circulating the water. Mm -hmm. And you know, half of it's down in the ground at uh, 48. Yeah, it's like 48 degree. I got you. I can't. I can't take credit for that idea. That came from uh, Dan Dan McLeod at Copia Farm. So I have to give him a shout. So out. using that thermal energy to keep yeah. it. Yeah. Nice. So. Uh, we did have a question um, from Kennedy Reynolds. She wanted to know. Uh, about the lights in the side here, and um, if they're if they're automatic and yes. and how you're using those. Yep. So basically, all our power is in that water room. Um, mm -hmm. They're on a timer, mm -hmm. so um, they're just going to run the 16 hours a day. I think they turn on it. Uh, well, right now, um, so when you get a new flock, um, you want to bring them into their 16 hours, depending upon their age, their body weight. Those are just some finer details to help out with their performance. But when they're full maturity, you want about 16 hours of light. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be running 16 hours in here. Keep that going. It's all on a timer. Off, gotcha. Off okay. Yeah. Nice. Because when you bring these in, you want to know what light pattern they were on. Yes. And then you match that, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so like, we get all the birds at 16 weeks. Mm -hmm. And at 16 weeks, I believe they're at um, 12 hours of light. I have to look at the sheet again. Yeah. But, uh, and, just, and different growers do slightly different patterns. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, when they come in, we want to do our best to match that. Although... Because we're a pasture-based system, you know, they're out in the sun, there's mobile coops. If we get them in June, we're going to have 16 hours of light, so we can't, we can't regulate that down yeah. if they need, you know, 12 hours. So, yeah. Um, it's, not, it's not a make-or-break scenario in a sense, but uh, no, it's it just sense. little things that we try to... Uh, you know, want to show, show, show me yeah. that box real quick, and then I want to ask you guys a question actually about your, your, your labor here. Mm -hmm. But, um, so, do you access this from the outside, or how do you get into this? Oh, right in here. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is kind of your control room here. Yep. Super fancy. <laughs> <laughs> Got it nice and insulated. Yep, yep. yep. Dug insulated. into the ground down there. Yeah, so the pipe comes out of the ground right behind this tank here. Mm -hmm. um, it's going into the tank and there's a pump in here. Okay, and it's sending it out the top line here. And I don't know if you can see it, but here's here's the water line. It's going down into that, and it's pumping it through mm -hmm. all the way down to the end. It goes down into the ground, comes back. It's just it's just constant cycle. Cool. So 
Uh, really, the trick is just to make sure the pump's always running, make sure no breaker yep. flips or something like that. But, um, awesome. Got your stay fix up there. Yep. Energizer. Nice. Box. It's all here. So. Cool. Yep. Awesome. Thanks for showing me in there. Yep. Step back out. Bruce, you want to show them the scale, how you yeah. get bird weights? Yep. Oh, wow. Yep. So, this guy... I would definitely recommend, but at the same time, I'm kind of behind. I'm getting on board. Just got it this year. Mm -hmm. um, it's two thousand dollars. I, I believe I got it off of farm farmboy.com or something like that. Uh huh. Um, basically, it's it's pre-programmed to be able to track your your entire flock, the, the body weights, keep mm -hmm. it recorded into that computer. It's gonna it's gonna know your flock. I haven't, to be honest, I haven't fully worked into this brain of this computer to utilize. So, it but is the idea system. that you know it, it measures them without you having to exactly. do it? Basically, yeah. just yeah. as it as it detects one bird on the platform yeah. or yeah. however many. If this wasn't here, we'd have to come out, weigh them by hand, yeah. mark it down. It'd be huge labor. Yeah, expense. that's. I mean, that's what we're doing with our turkeys and our chickens. Just yeah. doing, you know, we're doing sample sizes, weighing them manually. But yeah. we're not at this scale. But yeah. if you are, then having this scale yeah. uh, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and to be honest, you really only need one, even if you have multiple flocks, because, in my opinion, my opinion, you want to know their bird weight from age like 16 to like 30 weeks. Mm -hmm. After that, they should be fully matured, and they should stay with that that body weight. Yeah. You want to watch them during that time period, make sure they're making those daily gains. Mm -hmm. um, if they're not, you may have uh, issues with just overall health of the flock, lay rate. You're, just, you're going to have a lot of knowledge yeah. from that. So, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, I'm it's got, show people this box it's got daily gains on it. Um, you can just so, get the readout every day. Yeah, the target is 3.8 pounds right now. Um, mm -hmm. The last weighed bird was 3.846. Right on target. Yeah, uh, looks like 3.87 is the average. For the flock yeah. and it tells you how many it weighed yeah, 267 today was 267 mm -hmm. uh, we have 91 percent uniformity that's pretty important basically that means that just all the birds are within a certain weight range yeah and you do want that because if you have a lower uniformity that means you have a basically it's a it's it's a higher pecking order mm -hmm. there's a lot more variance in your flock um, which means you'll have different performance issues out of the end so yeah uniformity is pretty important no, that's, that, so. that's really cool. Thank you for yeah. showing me that. Yep. Love it. Um, and then what? we got a question from Luis the Sailor. Uh, you want to step out and uh, I get to this one here. Um, he just asked, you know, what you're feeding your birds. Yeah, that's a, that's a non-GMO uh, corn and soybean ration. Blake, you can probably speak better to that. Yeah, very similar to the hogs. Okay. Uh, just non-GMO corn, soy, and then a vitamin pack that would meet their requirements awesome yeah. super cool um well that's that that been incredible i do want to ask a question um you know about just kind of labor of the size of operation mm -hmm. um what does it take to come in here every morning and and do this at this scale uh, desire <laughs> <laughs> you gotta want to do it yeah yeah Blake's sure. absolutely right yeah it does take desire mm -hmm. yeah takes desire to do it um it's yeah it's it's complicated to have fourteen thousand hens out here and there's a lot a lot lot to take care of but um like how many people does it take to harvest every morning how long to get to gather the eggs yeah. um well we gather it from one to f one to five basically it's a three-man crew mm -hmm. so what is that like it's like it's in between like eight to nine man hours to be honest that's what usually would average it up gotcha wait how, how many uh eight to nine man hours okay gotcha so one sometimes bad. they get done at four there's just different variables but and, and what are they um they're putting in those crates that we saw earlier at the beginning of the stream yep. right they're just literally just they're going down along. those nesters i call i call them the human conveyor belt mm -hmm. they're, just, they're just moving with the nesters gotcha yep. gotcha just yeah. loading them up in there and then yeah. put them on the bed on a bed of a truck something driving them to the shop yeah and we actually have some downtime between going from one building set of buildings to the next so if mm -hmm. you know if everything was one place we could gather quicker yeah uh, but yeah. there's drive time between and you don't want to drive too fast or else you have scramble eggs before you get back. Gotcha. But hey, man, like you said, it's your most profitable enterprise. So it is. if you do, you do whatever it takes. Side, it's the most profitable yeah. enterprise that we have. So um, everything else kind of dictates around it. And this is another example of how you know, we're not buying in, uh, we're not buying in baby chicks to start now. We're starting with ready lay pullets. Yep. Gotcha. So someone else is, you know, that first, you know, that first uh, part of the life of that chicken is super important. Mm -hmm. And that's going to dictate how it's going to be able to lay. And unless you're totally set up to do that well, mm -hmm. you need to find somebody that can do it well. 
So. Um, yeah. Yeah. And uh, John, uh, which which chord? Which chord is that? I pronounced that wrong. But he asked um, how old are the birds when you get them, and uh, who's doing the brooding? Six, 16 weeks. Okay. They come in at sixteen weeks. Gotcha. Um, I got a couple different contacts. Uh, Moyers Moyers Hatchery out in Pennsylvania. With most of our flocks came from them. Gotcha. Um, Dutch Country Organics here in Indiana is another one. Uh, stage Stagecoach Organics. Stage Stagecoach Trail Organics, based out of Illinois. Super cool. Yeah. Awesome. Well, man, guys, I think uh, that covers most of what we wanted to cover on the tour, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, you got to see bits and pieces of, of every bit of our production enterprises. We didn't go too deep into any of them. but uh, No, it's been good, though. I mean, I, it's a real eye-opener. I know our hundreds of people watching have enjoyed it as well. Um, you know, I, I can't say thank you enough. Everybody, give these guys a round of applause. Let them know uh, your gratitude and what you think. Um, I want to just say thanks to everybody so much for watching uh, live here, or if you're watching the recorded version of this video, uh, here at Seven Sons Farm in Roanoke, Indiana, where they're doing an amazing job. You guys are an awesome family. Really, really grateful for you guys for inviting us out and uh, showing everybody your guys' farm as transparently as, as humanly possible today. Absolutely. Yeah. Th thanks for coming along with the yeah. tour. Awesome. All right. So thank you guys so much for watching uh, the Great American Farm Tour here at Heifer USA. If you've enjoyed this, make sure you subscribe to our channel. Hit that notification bell because we're going to be doing more of these Great American Farm Tours. I won't tell you exactly where we're going next, but I'll give you a hint. Um, he's a huge YouTube channel and he lives in North Carolina. So you, you, you let me know who you think that might be, but we're going to be um, out there sometime early November. So subscribe, like, follow for notifications. Check these guys out on social media, okay? If you haven't already, they have an awesome YouTube channel, great Facebook presence. You'll find all those links in the description of this video. And if you want to get access to or purchase some of their products, those links will be there for you as well. Because just seeing your production enterprises, I imagine it is very tasty. So you don't want to miss that and be sure to check some of that out if you want to get some of that delivered to your door, right? Absolutely. Delivered to your door. Keep it convenient. Awesome. All right. Thank you guys so much. We'll see you all next time.